there is nowhere on earth that better illustrates the importance of relationships and how you do business than China, in my experience. And frankly, I would extend that to most emerging markets. The critical importance of your established relationships, investing in those relationships on a non-transactional basis, right? Albeit where, where you end up doing business is correlated with where you have the best relationships. Ethan Devitt, and welcome to the 50 Faces podcast, a podcast committed to revealing the richness and diversity of the world of investment by focusing on its people and their stories. I'm joined today by Elizabeth Brown, who is Managing Director and Co-Head Elevate at GCM Grosvenor, where she works in the Sponsor Solutions Division. She was previously Head of Entrepreneurship and Family Office Partners at Redbird Capital Partners and was a senior member of the investment team at DNS Capital, a family office. She has held numerous board roles. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much. Thrilled to be here. Let's start with your background. Where did you grow up? What did you study? And how did you come to enter the world of investment? Sure. So I'm a Chicago native. Grew up in the city, in Uptown in in particular, and relevant because my mom during the week was a corporate banker and on the weekends was an Episcopal priest running parish. And so it was very important to her and very important to us as a family that we were both in the city, but among the congregation that she was ultimately spending a lot of her time with. You could say I, w- I was preordained to get into finance because of who my my mom was, but I, I don't think that's true. <laughs> Meaning she was there. She was never, I'm the youngest of three kids for three and four years. My mom was certainly not dogmatic about our going into finance, but she had been, her family has been a huge source of influence and, and importance for us and throughout our lives and very, very large, close family. And my mom, one of five kids, my granddad, uh, when she was growing up, was the chief financial officer of Sears in the 60s when Sears was Amazon. And he raised four for four daughters who were corporate bankers and a son who was ultimately an, an entrepreneur. And so that overlay of having four women in finance at the point that they were growing up in the you know, 40s, early 50s in Georgia that became a really transformative thread through our childhood series of my granddad talking always about the importance of education, but also the importance of creating greater access for women. In this case, he was famous for always talking about the fact that women were smarter and he couldn't figure out why women hadn't taken over the world yet. And so he saw it as a core cause of his to be able to ensure that women were capable in in every field and that given access to be capable in every field. And so when you grow up with a mom who is a sledgehammer to the glass ceiling, just extraordinarily inspirational, but also very excited about every new endeavor that she was taking on. I was really excited and inspired to go into finance because I'd seen what a critical determiner of her own path had been. She had not stayed in finance through the, the back half of her career. She ultimately started a grassroots community development organization when I was in my early teens. And that then became the, the catalyst for a lot of her global work. But finance was the core skill set and language that gave her access to go do what she did subsequently. So that was, that to me was sufficiently motivating. What an amazing story. What an enlightened man your grandfather seems to have been. If I I wish there was a podcast that captured him (laughs) somewhere. And I love that phrase also, the sledgehammer to the glass ceiling, because I think when you grow up with that empowerment is normalized. It's just so important to instill that in you from an early age. So let's talk us through your own journey. You mentioned finance clearly was almost a natural path. Sure. What did you study and what steps did you take to get there? Sure. So I, I had an incredibly nonlinear path. So I, I will say, while, while I was motivated by and excited about it, I did a host of other things that fell in the category of, I've been by virtue of who my mom is, both my parents were ultimately entrepreneurs. I am self-aware enough to know that I am an entrepreneur who benefits from guardrails, meaning I'm not the start a startup in my basement, risk temperament, personality. But I really love the idea of being able to build new things and likewise to be able to have systems level or macro level impact in terms of where I'm spending my time. And so it was clear to me in my, I did my undergraduate in sociology, psychology, and English. So classic liberal arts. I, I went to a university in Canada. All three of my siblings and I went to boarding school in Boston for high school. So by the time we got to college, and we we were very keen to experience the world in a different way because we lived away from home already for four years. And so my big sister and I were at McGill together in Montreal. 
And through the course of my studies, I discovered that I could take what was otherwise an average 800 person class size and distill it down into a 12 person class size by applying to graduate level programs as an undergrad. And so I then did a whole series of, of different grad level courses where principally still focused on sociology and psychology and English, but the core learnings were A, the importance of a well-rounded education and, and B, the importance of really understanding people, right? That's always going to be critical in any, in any job, in any life that I, I ultimately participated in, but I, I was very keen then to be able to move the needle on the systems level change, which for me had always gravitated around since a very, very early age, probably not surprising relative to what I, I shared about my mom, but really focused on investing in women and girls. That was always the core issue, my point of passion. I'd grown up spending time volunteering at the Salvation Army and the Women and Children's Shelter. And I was very keen. My summer internships looked very different from those of you know, the analysts that work on our team. I was working for the largest South suburban domestic violence services organization in Chicago called Family Rescue. And absolutely loved that work, loved the public policy implications of what they were doing, loved the legal side. I I'd told my parents from a very young age that I was going to be a Supreme Court justice so that I could go change the world. I had no appreciation for what that trajectory ultimately entailed. But as I thought about this line of investing in women and girls and being able to drive greater ROI through that, it was clear to me, A, that I, I needed to actually study finance. And instead of going into law, I was contemplating her finance and hybrid either JD MBA or a dual degree in public policy. I always really liked the macro micro interplay. And so I, I went from working in social services to moving to Beijing, which Longer story for another day, but had came from a family of entrepreneurs who started building operating businesses in, in China and in Beijing, in particular in the early 90s. And so that's been a huge influence in our family. My my mom had grown up in Sao Paulo uh, in Brazil for years because my granddad was starting the Sierra South America operations at the time. So we, we'd had a sort of cross current of emerging markets for a long time in our family. I was very keen to live in China, to learn to speak Mandarin. And in that context, I went to go work for Simpson Thatcher as a, do I want to do a JD MBA precursor to, to figure out if I loved it? And it, it was very clear to me, one of the core learnings from my time in China was the importance of speaking English fluently. That was my core value proposition, frankly, to the Simpson team, because I, I was surrounded by very capable career attorneys, but all of whom were native Mandarin speakers. And our client base in that mid to late 2000s period were the largest large cap private equity firms in the world who were sending over their and VP and principal level and MD level staff at, at the peak of what turned out to be the peak of China m a volumes, but where China was privatizing for the first time their state-owned assets and is the only native English speaker in the office outside of our managing partner. I was in a unique position of then being able to effectively host our clients. And as my managing partner said to me at the time, sit in the room, they will assume you know a lot more than you know, and then you can translate back what we need to be focused on. And so I, I had the benefit of having that core cohort of clients and a, a series of deal interactions that were way beyond what I, I had any business be exposed to in those years. And it was very clear to me coming out that going to business school and focusing on finance and investing was a much more interesting path to me than going being a deal lawyer. Same experience I had uh, <laughs> with being a deal lawyer and finding that grass was greener on the other side. So interesting. First of all, my daughter's up at McGill and to hear about that approach to tailoring a program, it's whittling down the numbers by careful class selection. So, so interesting and such a great way to build a network and gain exposure. And then I, just before we launched back into the business side, the focus on women and girls, mm -hmm. that and, and domestic violence. And I know that sometimes that can correlate quite a lot with economic backdrop, uh, recessions, COVID, I'm sure, was not a normal environment for that. Yeah. Have you seen any progress around awareness of these issues, resources available, or have we, and it's something that crops up as on the public eye from time to time, but then recedes into the background. Yeah. So COVID was a, for so many reasons, and I'll, I'll pay in a broader macro context, when the economy is at its worst and COVID was a, a crisis point for a whole host of reasons. We know based on the jobs data that right, if you look at peak COVID, 
jobs participation numbers, women's labor force participation declined back to 1980s levels at the height of COVID. On a look-through basis, when you looked at the height of COVID at who the disproportionate impacts had been, it was disproportionately women of color. And so to your point, there have been cross currents for a long time when, when the economy is doing badly, women tend to disproportionately suffer under those circumstances, doubly so for women of color. And in a city like Chicago, we also know that Chicago has been, continues to be a very segregated city and divided by race and class. That, that's been the case since I was a kid and uh, for decades, decades before that. Because of that, COVID also spurred it where you have financial disruption and or volatility that, that's caused by economic circumstances, you tend to see a proliferation of, of violence in homes or otherwise you already have chronic degrees of under-resourcing in, in some cases, but also just a huge amount of isolation during COVID, the amount that you didn't have recourse to the same social support system. So I, my first project, if you will, during COVID, you know, off the side of my desk, but near and dear to my heart was to work with the Chicago Metropolitan Battered Women's Network, which is the umbrella organization that coordinates all the domestic violence services and resources for the city that takes organizations like Family Rescue and Hull House and the cohort of other providers around the city and aggregates those service offerings, helps make connections to the, the Illinois Domestic Violence Act resources and, and, and those sorts of things. And I worked with them to help set up what became effectively their rainy day fund, their endowment to say you know, on a you know, small scale relative to the, the scale of, of large endowments, but to your point, to amplify these series of issues where we know that when the economy is in free fall, that women will disproportionately bear the brunt of that. That pain in this case, it only exacerbates the same trends you see around domestic violence. So not a heartening answer to your question, but it, you tend to see awareness of social issues, particularly those that affect women in minority communities, go in episodic waves as opposed to being consistent waves of momentum and support. Indeed. And like many issues, uh, thank you for highlighting the work you do there and the work you do. So just in terms of before we launch into your work at Grosvenor and Elevate, I'd like to just step back a bit to that frontier and developing markets timeframe, because clearly I always think having spent time not in Beijing area, but in Hong Kong and doing M&A also as a lawyer, as I mentioned, there are some real key takeaways of the way you do business there in terms of the way you have to improvise and you operate without much in the way of precedent that I think form an imprint on you and affect you for the rest of your career. Yeah. Any takeaways or lessons learned from that time for you? A hundred percent. So that this has influenced how I have, we, we talk a lot about in our world and our respective businesses, we talk a lot about investing being an apprenticeship business and investing being relationship business. There is nowhere on earth that better illustrates the importance of relationships and how you do business than China, in my experience. And frankly, I would extend that to most emerging markets. My key take, I, I lived in, in South Africa when I was in college and spent time living in Bulgaria in high school and, and then, then spent several years living in China. And the commonalities across all those, those markets, the critical importance of your established relationships, investing in those relationships on a non-transactional basis, right? Albeit where, where you end up doing business is correlated with where you have the best relationships. Mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. that's true worldwide, but in emerging markets, doubly so. And likewise, one big core theme that, that you see among Chinese families and, and certainly the case in, in my own family growing up was just the stalwart importance of education. Education is a conduit to access to opportunity. Mm. Right, that I think you tend to see those education as the great leveler of the playing field or the opportunity conduit to be able to ultimately you know, the the point of pride for Chinese family. My husband is South African and grew up in Pretoria, Johannesburg. And he talks a lot about the fact that it, it's a constant point of pride when you grow up in an emerging market to be able to enable your kids to do better than you've done, save the spirit of meritocracy in the U.S., but where education is really the linchpin of that opportunity set as you think about getting access to other markets. So I think those two core takeaways in terms of my time in China, the importance of relationships not being transactional, as counterintuitive as that may seem when you're working on transactions, but <laughs> it was the, the nature of investing long-term in those relationships, knowing that what would pay dividends was the authenticity with which you invested in those relationships. Mm 
We're going to take a short break to hear from the supporter of this series, Apollo Global Management. I sat down with Joe Moran, Managing Director, Institutional RIA Sales at Apollo. I asked him what excited his colleagues at Apollo when looking at the market environment in 2024. Well, in, in a world of rising rates, high inflation and heightened volatility, it will be harder for individuals to meet their income needs. Apollo, we're focused on providing differentiated alternative solutions for clients and their advisors to provide excess return along each point of the risk reward spectrum in exchange for giving up daily liquidity. And now back to the show. So interesting. And then the m and itself. Yeah, I think we talked about it was a really a peak level of activity then. Does that mean, well, what is it when there's a peak? Are there, you know, obviously timeframes are compressed, is due diligence is deep. Did you learn anything from that frenzy that maybe, again, was it was a lesson learned for, for long term? <laughs> yeah. So I think that that's one of the the great, it's a great question. It's a, one of the great life lessons. And I watched Madeleine Albright give a talk a few years ago, and she, and she was talking about the fact that as Secretary of State and that as a grown up more broadly, most people are just figuring it out. <laughs> that was my core observation from working you know, the the deals that were being done in in China, just in a macro context. And that that 2008 2009 timeframe, the U.S. economy was on fire. China had the only robust balance sheet globally in in terms of being able to transact. But you had sponsors who had the large cap private equity sponsors in the U.S. had raised record large funds on a relative basis then in, in that 2007 timeframe. And so they had, were sitting on billions of dollars of dry powder. China announced for the first time they were going to privatize assets that had previously been state owned. And so you had effectively a translation of the U.S.-based sponsors coming over to China to engage in these unprecedented transactions, but who there was a great theater production in Chicago a few years ago called Chinglish, which I don't know if you saw it, but is the sort of hilariously perfect representation of what that culture was like in, in China between U.S. and China in that, in that 2008, 2009 timeframe where you would have the American typically from New York fly over to Beijing and have booked flights that would have them on the ground for 36 hours and fully expect that they would be in position to negotiate, close a deal and get back on a plane. And that's antithetical to how Chinese business culture works. It's antithetical to how most people operate, right? You you would typically, it, it would be perceived, at least when I was living there, it was the case that it was perceived as very rude if you started just talking about business immediately. You would commonly go for a lunch or a dinner and only after you'd invested in the relationship would you be in position to talk about the deal. But that, of course, is the antithesis of how most people transact in the US and certainly in a New York bulge bracket and large cap firm context. And so it was one of the the great highlights of my time. And that was the basis for the transaction activity. One of the great highlights to your question on what I learned was that most people, once they're taken out of their media, in this case, both language and cultural context, but most people are really just trying to figure it out, that there was no precedent playbook for how best to execute large scale US-China transactions. There were only a handful of people who had done that at that point. And so it was humbling to watch it from that stage of my career and in essence to say it's it's table stakes to be good at what you do, but most of what you end up being great at, you're going to learn only by doing. It also sounds like there was a bit of a shortage of cultural education or translation or yes. whatever that kind of training you would do. <laughs> and again, it seems like that's often something that's reserved for good times. And boom times, and it gets completely put by the wayside. So really interesting. Well, let's move on now to Elevate and GCM. Sure. Can you tell us what that is exactly and what your work with emerging managers is? Sure. So I, I joined Grobner now just under a year and a half ago to launch our sponsor solutions business and Elevate, the first strategy within our sponsor solutions business, which explained simply is a seeding and stake strategy, but where the seeding is our portfolio companies, our asset management firms, focused on, in our case, private equity firms. But that in, in Grosvenor's experience, we have a large-scale private equity platform. In our experience of working with large-scale institutional clients globally, the most value creative and interesting end of the spectrum is in the emerging manager landscape, which we define as funds one through three, particularly so if you look at funds one and two in terms of where the most value is created. Grovner has had 
for a long time, a core focus, therefore, on emerging manager investing, as well as on diverse manager investing. We have been prolific supporters of diverse managers for a long time, and that's always been tied to performance and alpha generation. Right There, there was no concessionary bent in that focus, which started two decades ago. And, and so Elevate is really the combination of what have been the power alleys for Grosvenor in terms of a focus on diverse asset managers, on emerging asset managers, and being able to properly resource and equip those firm founders for success. And success, in our view, governed by setting up an institutional quality asset manager for private equity purposes, typically raising a minimum threshold of $300 million plus to go and prosecute what in, in this environment we think are really attractive strategies focused on sector specialists investing in the U.S. and, and typically in the low and mid market via context. But we are coming in, in essence, as the minority partner to those firm founders where we can be very catalytic and wide ranging capital as well as non-investment infrastructure support providers across the LP portion of their business, co-investment capital, working capital to resource that non-investment infrastructure, and then also layering in operating partner like capabilities on that non-investment infrastructure side. And defining emerging managers, do you, besides the level of what they're at in terms of their fund? So it's the vintage number, right? So a fund one, two, or three, the, the reality of the use case for us is typically focused on a fund one or fund two mm -hmm. in, in terms of maturity curve. And then likewise, sub billion dollar fund sizes customarily, and or we think of the mid market as defined by enterprise value sub $3 billion. That's where the core cohort most emerging managers will quote graduate from that right. emerging manager cohort above about a billion to a billion five for capital. The reason I ask is that Chicago Police, they were conflation of the emerging manager concept with the minority owned manager concept. And that the focus was on emerging managers, but it tended there was a lot of overlap, hmm. but it wasn't necessarily one category or the other. Given I was focused on that back in 2016 yeah. uh, with Chicago Police, how would you say the landscape has changed, improved, disimproved, say the same? in terms of fundraising and just getting attention yeah. and what are the barriers to entry like? So it's a, the Grosvenor team on the private equity side of our business have done and across asset class, but private equity in particular has, has been very focused on emerging manager investing, diverse manager investing for two decades. And the evolution of the data is very encouraging in, in terms of the absolute number of both emerging and, and diverse managers and that the growth rate has been 10 plus percent CAGR over the course of the last 10 years. Having said that, you see that emerging managers are still woefully undercapitalized relative, especially to the performance. Meaning sitting in, in Chicago, I'm, I'm cognizant of the sort of classic, you know, you Chicago textbook market inefficiency. That's what you see over and over in emerging manager, meaning where you have systematic undercapitalization paired with multi-decade outperformance. We know that that inefficiency shouldn't exist. There are a bunch of core structural reasons why it does exist, meaning not just for diverse founders. We know there are a whole, whole series of, of social reasons why biases persist in that segment of the market in particular, but where even broadly for emerging managers, emerging managers, I would argue there's a miscalculation of the risk reward associated with emerging managers, meaning there's a misperception of how much risk you're taking, knowing that both returns are being generated in those earliest vintages on the one hand. And on the other hand, you tend to have the most motivated founders at, at that stage of their careers. And so it's not surprising to me that you end up with the best returns in, in that segment of the market. Again, smaller fund sizes, more dedicated strategies, years ahead of, of when you would otherwise be thinking about succession plans and cultural imperatives along those lines. There's more focus on emerging managers because the absolute number has increased, but it's still the case that the greatest beneficiaries of capital flows from LPs are disproportionately large cap firms whose performance doesn't justify the fact that they're taking 85 to 90% of LP capital in any given year. Yeah, it is one of those inefficiencies and dislocations. And back to the women and girls question, but asked in a slightly different way. Sure. Female portfolio managers, female founders. Again, I think that seems to be an area that there's not a lot of capital flowing necessarily. What's been your experience around that? And maybe not even at the founder level, just the representation. No. Yeah. So I, I'd say broadly, there's a lot more discussion than capital. <laughs> there's a lot more, more marketing than tangible focus. But where you see capital flows, the capital flows have been 
de minimis or subscale. And I don't mean just in terms of the absolute dollars. I mean, the focus, I understand the utility of focusing on venture capital, for example, in terms of that being the start of the value chain. But the analog in my mind is focusing only on the pipeline of talent and finance, where we know that analyst classes now are 50-50 and at gender parity. So in my view, if you focus only on the venture end of the value chain, which for a lot of the gender-based financing initiatives are focused, you're saying, one, we know that only a fraction of companies are appropriate for and should be venture financed. And so you're taking a, a tiny fraction the market, but calling that a proxy for backing innovation writ large and focused on women founders. That's not to disparage those efforts. I'm thrilled they exist, genuinely so, but I don't think that it's enough because you end up then focusing on disproportionately the capital is going to micro VCs, meaning that range of sub 25 to $30 million fund sizes. We're writing a few million dollars of allocation to female founders and on an underlying basis, female entrepreneurs. You just don't make a tangible impact in the value chain and it therefore allows the market broadly to say that was proof of concept or that was otherwise concessionary, you would expect higher rates of failure in micro VC context mm -hmm. with first time founders. And so I think it just skews again that risk reward perception. The reason we've been so focused in mid market buyout is not just because that is core to, to Grovner's skill set and DNA, but because if you look at a $100 trillion asset management market, $7 trillion of that sits in private equity today, the composition of portfolio managers has been and diverse or underrepresented, so including gender statistics, but gender, racial and ethnic diversity, disability status, and LGBTQ plus status, as well as commonly U.S. veteran status are incorporated in those diversity definitions. The percentage of diverse or underrepresented founders and PMs has been 1.4% for 10 years, right? And so it gets to the issue of if you only focus on the pipeline, right? Where in my experience, and the data would corroborate this, in my experience, it's not that you have a hard time finding sufficient talent at the junior levels. It's making it through in a private equity context, what we think of as the VP bottleneck or getting through that level of seniority. And it's the exact same in PM context, right? So if you never have women in the case of uh, gender diversity who are elevated to being the sector head or vertical lead, it's not just that you need them to get to the sector head or vertically, you actually need to be encouraging the mid tier of the pipeline, which in my analogy is encouraging the moving the needle on a $7 trillion segment of the market as opposed to allocating million dollar by million dollar allocations to a 15 to $20 million micro VC. You're preaching to the choir here. That's exactly the point of this podcast is to provide support and executive coaching to that level, because I think we need to see other women succeeding. We need to see whether it's the mirror neurons and the people who look like us and also just hear some of the setbacks, the lessons learned. Wisdom like yours, investing in the long term and networks and relationships that will pay dividends long term. I don't think there's a lot of textbooks that contain those words of wisdom, or if they are, they're not teaching them at the college level. So, so really, thank you for that. Moving to some of your other interests, and we've touched on them a little in terms of something you've sustained through your life as well as the pandemic. You have a number of board roles. Can you talk maybe about some of them? Any interests close to your heart? Sure. I have been a, a single issue participant in, <laughs> in terms of my interests. I'm a mother of two daughters, which my, my friends and family would argue was biologically predetermined based on what I care about. And I have likewise continued that interest really focused on investing in women and girls, but entrenching greater equity in financial markets. That's my baby. That is my passion and cause. And so that has manifested in my spending a lot of time on things like the Private Equity Women Investor Network, the Chicago Network, which is a cohort of senior executive women in Chicago, but firmly committed to entrenching greater equity in this case in business broadly and in, in enhancing the access and opportunity for in business and both cultivating, but really nurturing that pipeline opportunity set, the Women's Association of Venture and Equity. And then I, I just joined Kellogg's Advisory Board Network for Private Equity Globally. So all, all cross currents of how do you go and move the needle in an industry that is still woefully underrepresented with respect to every diversity criteria at this point, but especially so for, for women having been the only or one of the only my entire career. I've been laser focused on not just the underlying thesis that, that motivates your podcast in terms of representation really mattering, but that it's 
in my experience, the right kind of representation matters, meaning the having enough examples that the one doesn't get extrapolated to what the possibility set is for the many if you're the only woman partner, for example, but also that it's a relatable example insofar as there are Anecdotally, most women I know who I grew up with in finance had the story of the one woman who ran their division having never had kids or never gotten married or never did things that we know percentage-wise most people will end up doing in this country. And so it was a, not a relatable example, right? And so they'd say, if I want to make it there, I have to do X, Y, Z. And they would extrapolate what the course their life had to look like based on the one example because they only had recourse to one. Right? And, and so I've been very focused on ensuring there is not just absolute diversity in terms of the senior teams, but that you have enough relevant examples that it gives you an opportunity to define your course. Because otherwise that's what, in my view, will teach people effectively what, what the options are. I think you have to see it. I don't think there's substitute for that. So true. And I think also one of the areas that is endemic in any career will be setbacks, challenges. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think there are some differences with how maybe women may absorb setbacks. And certainly having less of a community to share them with, to hear from them, to hear best practice can determine whether or not they bounce back and to what degree and how long that takes. Your own career, you said it's not linear, but yet it has seemed very successful. Were there any setbacks or challenges in there that you learned lessons from? Many. <laughs> I think that is a bit to me the point, meaning I, I think there are very few ways to learn a lesson as concretely than if you try really, really hard to do something and fail at it, or it, it doesn't manifest in, in the way that you anticipated. I, I have certainly not had, I, I had this conversation with my mom actually a few weeks ago. It's funny, she said, I've seldom failed at anything in my life. And that, that's not a, a point of hubris <laughs> in the fact. Relative to, wow, I, I feel like I've failed at a lot of things through the, through the course of my career. And that that has been absolutely fundamental to my learning process. But I, I think the, the core takeaway from that, you know, humility always is, is a good governor. But I, I think one of the core takeaways for me has been a couple of points of motivation for me in my career, which is, you know, and I, I give full credit to Ginny Rometty, who is famous for saying this, but the idea that growth and comfort never coexist is sort of fundamental to my being. Meaning when I, when I think about how I process those setbacks, there are a lot of jokes in my family about my being the youngest of three kids haven't given me very thick skin. It's true. But you really need thick skin. And I think as I experience you know, setbacks, failures, challenges in my career, both having really thick skin, but also not over extrapolating what that implied in terms of my ability to be successful in the future, or, or said differently, a tie to false perfectionism that says, if you fail at something, you are therefore destined to not be able to succeed. I think that's such a false calculus that in my experience, women disproportionately tend to make, meaning if you are not perfect or you are criticized for something, then it must mean that you're destined to not be good enough. And the guys that I know, and particularly so in finance, have very healthy egos to start with, but perceive those setbacks as just an opportunity to pivot. <laughs> right? and say, what swim lane can I now pivot to in order to be successful? Because that feedback, I'll integrate it and now use it to be better as opposed to internalizing it as a fundamental condemnation of what your, your skill set or ability is. I love that the Founders podcast, which actually focuses on a lot of male founders, but the expression problems or opportunities and work clothes comes up over and over again. So I think that probably gets to that positioning and framing of setbacks. You've spoken a lot about women that you've worked with and being inspired by, I think, starting right at the family side. Were there any particular mentors or sponsors in your career? And I always ask this question because sometimes we have a perhaps an unrealistic notion of the number of mentors we need or sponsors mm -hmm. have needing. And often many women on this podcast, many people have not had any sponsors. Mm -hmm. so I'm curious about your experience. I have been really lucky from a young age to, and I think probably because I, I've been focused for a very long time on, on not building my network in a networking sense, but in investing in relationships. That, that's really been the core of how I've I've approached my nonlinear career journey is just go work for, and this was advice I got very early on from key mentors and my parents, to just go work for the smartest people that you could find from whom you could learn the most and who are willing to put you in positions of unnatural responsibility. That was my job description or job aspiration. And so that governed 
both I, I found the people who were most willing to invest in me and therefore mentor and sponsor me were those who saw familiarity people like attracts like people want to invest in people who remind them of themselves, which may be a, a commentary on human ego, but it's just a reality of my experience. And so I've, I've had the benefit of both mentors and sponsors throughout my career who were keen to invest in me because it was so clear to them that I was willing to do basically anything to learn as much as I could. Right. That I, I I talk a lot to my team about there being no substitute for great attitude and great work ethic. Right. That if you turn up with those two things, what we do is not rocket science. You can learn how to do most things under the sun, short of being a medical doctor or surgeon or things that require fundamental training and finance. It's all apprenticeship. It's all learning by doing and developing judgment on the basis of your failures and your successes and then recalibrating that that path along the way. I love that. Again, a reminder to invest in those relationships. And was there any advice specifically that you received or that you internalized as a creed or a motto? Yes. So I always knew I I wanted to be a mom. That that was crystal clear to me from a young age and from growing up in a big family. And I I said to a, a then senior woman at Goldman, who was the standard for what I wanted to be when I grew up. And I, I said to her, I'm, I'm curious, you've been a mom through navigating a, a very successful career course. I've noticed there are not a lot of women here. I also doubly noticed there are not a lot of women who have kids here. And how did you do that? And what advice would you offer? I was effectively asking her in a stereotypical classic type A way, help me draw the roadmap for me of when I should have kids and what's the most convenient time and when should I go to graduate school? And she just burst out laughing. She was like 45 at the time. And then she burst out laughing and said, have kids whenever you want. Make the life decisions that are going to make you a good human being and that will make you proud of yourself. And act in accordance with your values and your sense of integrity and know that your reputation is the most important thing that you have. That's it. (laughs) Stop trying to make a plan. Stop trying to over-engineer or orchestrate this. Because like you being happy with your life is the point, right? All of those other building blocks, like the fact that you could let your childbearing timeline, A, that you could assume that you had any control over that whatsoever, or B, that you could work that in and around your career aspirations is just nuts. Like don't drive yourself crazy trying to hold yourself to that standard. I and I've never forgotten it. That was a a core one for me. The other big piece of advice, which I often quote because it was such a more an observation than a piece of advice, but just been so determinative, comes from my mom, which that I, I asked her when I was in college, mom, what was it like being the only woman who was leading then a, a corporate banking division? And she was turning up at the office pregnant three times over the course of, of four years and having people say, are you ever not pregnant? And it's gross that you continue to work and you all, all of the things you'd expect people say in the 70s and 80s that at that point in court banking context where women weren't allowed to wear pants until the 1990s coming to the office. And you know, my, my mom very cheerfully said, I just thought of being a woman as a huge advantage because everybody remembered my name. And that that reframing to me has has been really foundational as I've navigated a course in finance. That if if you think of your differentiation as superpower and an ability to open different doors or have different presence or different memorability, it all goes back to the same end of investing in relationships and using what makes you unique. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Not everyone is lucky enough to come from a long line of renegades as you have. (laughs) But what you have done, I think since the very beginning, is convert that wisdom into wisdom you can share with a generation of peers, as well as people coming into the pipeline, as well as the investee companies that you can promote and work with at Grosvenor Elevate. So thank you so much for coming here, for your commitment to the industry and this issue, and for sharing your insights with us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Ethan Devitt. Thank you for listening to the 50 Faces podcast. If you liked what you heard and would like to tune in to hear more inspiring investors and their personal journeys, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice and all views are personal and should not be attributed to the organizations and affiliations of the host or any guest. 